Welcome to Buddies in Bad Times Theater. My name, thank you. <laughs> my name is Evelyn Perry, I'm the artistic director here and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all this evening and it's really fabulous to see such a great turnout for this important civic conversation. So thanks for being here. Um, I'm so happy to be hosting this conversation in this theater space. I don't think there's any more appropriate space to hold such a conversation than a theater. And uh, I want to take a moment to acknowledge that part of the way that we keep the lights on and the doors open here is because we have funding from a number of levels of uh, public public funders, including the federal funders. And I just want to say thank you to the Canada Council for the Arts and the Department of Canadian Heritage for all the support that they give to this theater, which is Canada's largest and longest running queer theater company. Um, now we've been in this building, this city owned building for 25 years and uh, that's quite an achievement as a queer company to have carved a space like this. But of course, this building stands on land that has been occupied by humans for many thousands of years before this theater stood here. And it's important to me whenever we gather together to acknowledge the caretakers of the land and those on whose shoulders we stand here. And so I want to name the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, and to acknowledge this is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. And we give thanks to those stewards of this land, and it is also on the shoulders of the queer and two-spirit and trans ancestors that we stand here at Buddies. So we say thank you to all those caretakers and trailblazers and lovers and fighters. Thank you. And with that, I want to introduce uh, the organizer of tonight's uh, event, Doug Kerr. Hey, hey. Hey, hi, everybody. Hello. Um, I'm just wondering, can we have uh, the candidate just come up? They're still standing there. Maybe just come in and, and have a seat. Maybe before we start, Rachel will do a, an introduction. So hi everybody, my name is Doug Kerr and I am, uh, I'm with Dignity Network, uh, one of the organizers of tonight. And uh, I wanna say a couple things before we start. Uh, first of all, today is actually International Lesbian Day. So I wanna, um, <laughs> I, I know how many of you know that, but if you are a lesbian, happy International Lesbian Day. And if you're not, uh, maybe do something really nice for your lesbian friends tonight. <laughs> So um, I want to just say as well, uh, this is a volunteer project. Many of our, these organizations did this, uh, this, this series of events. There's five of these town halls happening across Canada. Uh, so I really want to thank the volunteers. There are eight organizations, I think eight, uh, that have come together from across the country. And I'm going to name them and hold your applause till the end. The Community-Based Research Center, the Canadian Center for Gender and Sexual Diversity, the Canadian HIV AIDS uh, Legal Network, the uh, Canadian LGBT Chamber of Commerce, Dignity Network, EGAL Canada, uh, Le Conseil Québécois LGBT, uh, Fierté Canada Pride, and Proud Politics. So all these organizations have come together to put on these series of events, and I think it might be the first time ever in Canadian history that we've had anything like this. So please give them a round of applause. I also, um, I do have an apology to make. I think it's important to say. Uh, give, uh, the, tonight is also the first, the night of Yom Kippur, and uh, many people in the Jewish, our Jewish community, the Jewish community weren't able to be here because of that, and we have to apologize. We had a lot of scheduling challenges trying to find a venue that worked, and of course the schedule of the campaign was very tight. So um, we do want to acknowledge that and make a commitment that we will try and uh, do better when the election happens again, maybe four years from now. So, um, so uh, without further ado, there's one thing we also want to uh, say before we start. As part of this project, Proud Vote, a number of organizations came together to develop a statement. And this is the first time again in Canada that we've ever done something like this. And this statement is a coalition of over 218 organizations that developed uh, a common statement about the election. I'm going to read it because I think it's important and uh, we're going to present it to all the candidates. So the statement is, we call on all political parties running in the Canadian federal election to commit to ensuring that human rights for sexual and gender minorities are secure in Canada and that our communities continue to be reflected in all areas of federal policy, both domestic and international. 
There continue to be policy areas for Canada to improve in, and we call on all future governments to continue to work with LGBTQ2S civil society organizations in moving forward to address issues that still face our communities. So I have this signed by over 208, 218 organizations from every province and territory. I'm going to present it to the candidate. Thank you. To our, uh, also, I should mention our, our media sponsor tonight is Extra, so please give them a round of applause. And this is uh, Rachel Giza from Extra. Uh, thank you so much, Doug, and um, welcome, everybody. It's wonderful to see uh, such an amazing turnout. Before I open this up um, to our uh, community experts to ask their questions, I have just a little bit of housekeeping to do, and then I will introduce the candidates as well. Um, the purpose of this, uh, this event tonight is to talk about LGBTQ2 issues nationally. So the folks on our stage will be addressing um, their party's um, policies um, and promises and focus on a national level, not on a their local riding level. Um, I know that this is a very um, passionate um, election and uh, I'm really glad that people are here and they want to participate in this way. Um, I would just ask that, um, that everyone be courteous and respectful and um, be mindful of the applause or the boos. Um, we'd really like this to be a conversation um, that is uh, civil and thoughtful and, um, and I, you all look very, very nice. So I'm I'm sure this won't be a problem at all. Um, and uh, um, I want to say that the extra team is actually live streaming this. Um, it's on our, uh, our Facebook event page. Um, if you want to uh, tweet or put anything about this on social media, I'd ask that you use the hashtag ProudVote. Um, we're also going to be recording this and it'll be available on our YouTube channel so for folks who didn't see it they can actually watch it uh, later um, and if I could get a little plug in for the amazing work that extra is doing um, the whole editorial team is here which is really exciting to me and I'm enormously proud of the work that they do um, I would encourage you to sign up for our rainbow votes 2019 newsletter which has been uh, covering LGBTQ2 issues in the election Election. Um, so you can go to our website uh, and and find that. Um, if you have questions, uh, extra senior editor Erica Lenti is over here. Um, just wave your hand if if um, if you have questions that you want to ask to any of the folks on the stage. Erica will pass you a piece of paper to write them down. We're going to try to get to uh, questions from the audience. Um, we might not have a ton of time. We're going to try to wrap this up about 15 minutes early. So if you do want to talk to uh, any of the folks on stage will have an opportunity to do that. Um, and we also, ahead of this, gathered questions uh, from uh, people across Canada who had questions specifically to do with LGBTQ2 issues. Um, so I'm going to try to get a few of those questions in as well. So uh, before I introduce these folks, um, this is how it's going to run. There's going to, I'm going to ask the people representing the various LGBTQ2 organizations to come up on stage. They'll stand here um, and ask their questions. Um, everyone here will, be, will get about two minutes to answer. Um, we have a volunteer here, um, Ermias. Can you just stand up for a second? Um, Ermias has a rainbow flag, and when the two minutes is hit, uh, he's going to wave that rainbow flag. So that's a signal to the, to the folks on stage. It's much cuter than one of those flashing lights, we think. Um, so that will be your cue to um, wrap up. Um, and each of the candidates will have uh, two minutes at the top to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about who they are. And then everyone is going to have a turn at, uh, at the end to have two minutes in closing. And Doug, have I forgotten anything or is that? It's live on Facebook. So um, thank you all for being here and we're going to get started. Okay. 
So um, I'll introduce you folks uh, one by one, and I'll just start here um, on my left. Um, and we were having a joke earlier, this does not necessarily reflect everyone's positions on the political spectrum, it's just the seating. Um, but if you need a reminder of which party these folks are representing, we have the balloons behind them as a little cue. Um, <laughs> Again, we do it with style. Um, so um, I want to start on my left, uh, Brian Chang from the NDP. Brian, go ahead, please. Who's watching me? Oh, and just a reminder to everybody, <clears throat> in order for this to be recorded properly, you need to hold the mics fairly close to your mouth. Do you want us to have, oh, you got it? There we go. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Chang. Um, I go by the pronouns he, his, him. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here today. I live just around the corner with my partner, Jeff, um, just on Grenville, just on the edge of the, of the village. And I think it's really important that we have representation that comes from our area and understands what we're standing up for, uh, the communities that are worth fighting for. And I think I'm one, probably the only person that has probably performed on this buddy stage um, in both rooms. Um, and I've spent hours rehearsing in the in, I in have to fact check. Too. I think Nikki has performed. Sorry. Oh, there we go. <laughs> So why it matters, though, is because one of the reasons I decided to start running was because I was tired of seeing my friends no longer be able to afford to live in this area. I was tired of seeing them, 35-year-old, uh, 40-year-old friends, living with multiple roommates in the village just to stay in the area in units not designed for it. I was tired of seeing a struggle to take climate change seriously, the climate emergence seriously. And really, it's the number one issue that's coming up at the doors right across, uh, right across Toronto Centre. And it was really about trying to think about the ways in which our governments have let us down over the course of the past four years, and really, what do we want to see? What does that future look like when, when uh, friends who have HIV have the medication paid for and they don't have to worry about paying for that out of pocket? What does it mean when the village is vibrant and full of art and culture, and we're not all struggling contract to contract, and we're working and living beautiful, vibrant lives, creating the art that we all love in this community in places just like buddies in bad times? What does it look like when we have a future ahead in which post-secondary education is covered, in which we don't have to graduate with tens of thousands of dollars in debt that set us so far behind that we can't even get started properly? And that's what's worth thinking about in this election. What is the future that we're trying to build that has a clean environment, that has affordable housing, that has healthcare that's expanded so that everybody, everyday people are taken care of. And that's ultimately what the NDP is about and why I want to stand up, because I'm tired of seeing my friends struggle to have their medication costs covered. Um, thank you so much. I look forward to talking to you all tonight. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, so next we have representing the Conservatives, Ryan Lester. Ryan, over to you. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. And my pronouns are he, him, and his. And I have performed on this stage, although it wasn't a ticketed event. <laughs> Both this one and the one next door. Um, maybe a bit of a testament to how long it's been since I've been here. Uh, I went downstairs to use the washroom before this event and was very impressed and delighted to see that it's been completely converted to gender neutral spaces. And you know, that wasn't the case when I was here last. And so it warms my heart to see that because it's been more than 10 years uh, like Brian, of living in Toronto Centre, it's my home. Uh, down the street, at uh, church in, in Dundas neighbourhood, but a couple different spots as we move around um, over the years that we've made Toronto Centre and, and the village our home. You know, I moved here more than 10 years ago as a young, gay, closeted, terrified kid from a small town in southwestern Ontario called Sarnia. Uh, this is the part where someone usually screams or cheers from Sarnia, but <laughs> looks like it's not going to be tonight. Um, and, and this was the community that welcomed me with open arms regardless of that. And, and for that reason, it will always hold a special place in my heart. You know, this is the community that loved me no matter what. Um, they let me wear the ridiculous things I wore 10 years ago and do the ridiculous things I did to my hair 10 years ago and, and be the ridiculous guy that I was on this stage and, and up and down the various establishments that we all know and love on Church Street. And over that time, I got to uh, have the privilege of working with some truly remarkable organizations in our community. I've been a director at the uh, AIDS Committee of Toronto as their treasurer. I've been a director on the staff team at Pride Toronto, at EGAL Canada Human Rights Trust, and even the Canadian Centre for Diversity and Inclusion. So this is really uh, a great night for me. It's great to you know, wrap all of this up into 
an experience. This is a community where I have gone out. I've fallen in love. I've fallen out of love. I've been married in this community, and uh, now I'm running to represent it as your MP in Ottawa. So I look forward to tonight's conversation, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, and now we have representing the Greens, Nikki Ward. My name is Nikki Ward, and I'm honored and not a little bit surprised to be here. Uh, I have a long history of advocacy in the area of LGBTQ rights and specifically around gender identity. Uh, those who know me know I take no prisoners. And I think the people who, uh, even the people who don't particularly care for me, know that I don't make decisions lightly, that I try and apply my efforts where they will do the most good. And there is no question in my mind that the best work that we can do going forward is vote for the Green Party of Canada. As an LGBTQ uh, person, individual, not only was I welcomed, but I was welcomed as more than just a bloody token. I was welcomed as somebody engaged in policy development and engaged as a candidate, not a sacrificial lamb. And we all know what it's like to be tokenized, or at least one of us does. So um, I thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to keep my comments brief and relatively amusing, but I assure you, if you go to the, uh, either my website, nickyward.ca, or the Green Party of Canada, you will see specific, written, costed plans and a huge area devoted to gender equality. And trans rights are gender rights, are human rights, and that's what the Green Party stands for, and that's why I'm here. Thank you, Nikki. And finally, representing the Liberals, we have Rob Oliphant. Thank you very much, and thanks to all of you. I'm Rob Oliphant. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm the Member of Parliament for Don Valley West, which is, uh, I like to think of it as Midtown Toronto. Um, I am a former resident of Toronto Centre, and I am proud to be the Liberal candidate running the next election in Don Valley West. I wanted to uh, start tonight by talking about um, at one particular day uh, in the House of Commons uh, when I was invited to sit beside the Prime Minister in the front row uh, for question period. And during question period, after his leader's round had finished, he opened up his book and he started in long hand uh, writing and working on the apology to the LGBTQ2 community. And I watched him as he uh, penned words as he struck out words that were written to make that apology his own. And shortly after question period, he stood in the house, and some of you were there that day. He stood in the house and he offered a sincere, profound, and deep apology to lesbians, gays, transgendered, bisexual, two-spirited people in this country who had been abused, hurt, harassed, maligned by the federal government. That day was profoundly important for me. I'm 63 years old, and I have lived through these last 50 years as we've attempted to find ways of having dignity, human rights, equal rights for marriage, respect for our relationships, married or not, um, a way to, to be together in this community of Canada and to fulfill what we believe to be our rightful aspirations as Canadians and to do that. And that apology was extremely powerful for me and it's the reason I want to run again as a Liberal Member of Parliament. I'm pleased about, with our record. I'll be defending it tonight. We have a Prime Minister who has done more for LGBTQ rights than all the Prime Ministers put together in this country and I'm proud to stand with him. Thank you very much, Rob. Okay, so now I'm going to turn the mic over to our community experts. Uh, the first person I want to call to the stage is Michael Quagg from the Community-Based Research Center. Do you want to hold it or do you want me to put it on the stand? Okay. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so uh, the Community-Based Research Center is a national nonprofit dedicated to improving the health of sexual and gender minorities. This year, along with dozens of community, public health, and academic experts, we submitted evidence and provided testimony to the Health Committee's study on the health of LGBTQ2 Canadians, drawing attention 
to the systemic health and social inequities faced by our communities, including high rates of HIV and other STIs, mental health issues, problematic substance use, and suicide. We were thrilled to see the committee's historic report and the 23 recommendations to the federal government for improving the health of LGBTQ2IA Canadians. We were further encouraged uh, that the report was endorsed unanimously by the Liberals, Conservatives, and NDP. Th the recommendations include prioritizing issues such as stigma and discrimination faced by trans and queer people in schools or in healthcare settings, or the barriers to essential health services, such as hormone therapy, transition-related surgery, or medications necessary for the effective treatment or prevention of HIV. My question is, if elected, how will your government respond to the Health Committee's recommendations to ensure that meaningful actions are undertaken to improve health and social outcomes for diverse queer, trans, and two-spirit communities? While health does remain a provincial jurisdiction, the committee's report clearly suggests a need for greater leadership from the federal government. This is especially important in light of inconsistent provincial and territorial responses, which continue to produce highly uneven access and quality of services. How will your government respond to provincial in inaction, or in some cases, hostility to the increased federal role in improving the health of LGBTQ2I Canadians? Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so why don't uh, why don't we start uh, this time from the end? I'll start with you, Rob, if you want to leap in, and the timer is going. Thanks very much for that question. I was very very pleased with the health committee's work um, on this, uh, chaired by Bill Casey. They um, they took the the time and the opportunity to hear from coast to coast to coast uh, Canadians who raised concerns of mental health issues of um, sexually transmitted disease issues, of health work, uh, of sex workers issues, of a variety of uh, health issues that relate to LGBTQ community. And absolutely, our government has already got this as a blueprint. Um, I, think, I believe you know that, that we have taken this. We have a majority on the committee, and we will continue to do that. Now, we're into a very difficult time ahead. Um, when the committee started working, we still had friendly provincial governments across this country. We now have conservative governments mostly across this country that we have absolutely no confidence in that they will work with us as partners. They're not working with us in partners in affordable housing. They're not working with us in partners on, on uh, immigration issues. They're not working with partners on so many issues that are absolutely critical to all Canadians. And this will take strong federal leadership. And our government is absolutely committed to strong federal leadership on these issues. We'll do it through the Canada Health Act. We will do it legislatively. We will do it with regulations. And we will do it with encouragement. And we will just hope to bring down some conservative governments across the country as well. Thank you very much. Um, Ryan, I'm actually thinking I'll go to you after that one. <laughs> So we'll skip and return back. Yeah, well, I guess shots fired. I may as well take a, a chance at addressing that. You know, Rob mentioned that the Liberals have a majority on the Health Committee, and we've seen that they have a majority on a number of committees. There was not too long ago, in March, in fact, uh, of this year, that a petition of no less than 18,000 names was presented to the Health Committee calling for a national ban on conversion therapy. And what did Rob's colleagues do with their majority on the health committee? They turned it down. What did they do when a colleague from the NDP suggested the same motion be adopted at the health committee banning uh, conversion therapy across this country? They shut it down. Again, they said that it is not an issue for the federal government. So here we have the liberals talking out of both sides of their mouths. And you know what? We're not surprised. You're not surprised sitting here looking at it. You're not surprised that you heard it out of Rob's mouth first, and you're not surprised to hear me talk about it. We've heard it for months. We've heard it for years, in fact. I voted for Mr. Morneau in the riding of Toronto Centre, where I'm now running against him, and the Prime Minister, because I believed what they were telling me four years ago about being a champion for the LGBT, 
specifically when they committed to ending the ban on blood donation and when they committed to ending the criminalization of HIV. But I'm sure we'll get to those two topics later tonight. Overall, however, I think we all can see a pattern, a pattern of poor judgment and poor behavior, a pattern that leaves us all thinking, can I really trust what they're saying? Things like a national pharmacare program, again, in their platform this year. However, for those of us that can remember, this was a part of their national platform in 1997. Made a resurgence in 2004, and here we are again, hearing about a commitment from this Liberal government for a national pharmacare program. Now I stand with my colleagues here on the, ta on the stage to say that enough is enough, the empty promises are transparent, and we just don't buy it. Okay, time, thank you. Um, Nikki, do you want to jump in? <laughs> well, I want to make sure everyone gets their two minutes. Pardon me? Yeah, you're next. Yep, yep, you've got your two minutes. Right, okay. Uh, let's get, let's get right cracking to it, okay? Um, firstly, uh, just a, a small fact check. The Green Party did and does sign off on that, not just the three uh, people here. Um, the second thing to uh, uh, bring is that I actually have had quite enough leadership. I would like to see some action on this. Uh, we know fully well, particularly those in the trans community, uh, that the, uh, the determinants of health tell us that being trans shortens your life expectancy and access to basic health care. Never mind transition services, but things like getting a broken arm fixed is very, very difficult. This is all a cop-out. We don't need leadership. We have the tools to do it. The Canada Health Act speaks specifically to universality and transportability. It must be a consistent across Canada, and there are and should be rigorous federal standards that must be met. And if not, no transfer payments, thank you very much. You're not getting your money until you do things the right way. We have federal standards for aviation, for trains. Why don't we have federal standards for health care? And they should be the highest levels across Canada, not just on the lowest common denominator. Anyway, that's what I think. Next. Okay. Uh, over to you, Brian. Go ahead. Thank you so much. So first of all, I'm going to respond, first of all, to, the cons to my conservative colleague here. So that petition he was talking about was actually introduced by NDP MP Sherry Benson for the MP, the NDP MP for Saskatoon West. So I'm happy that you brought that up. Thank you. Uh, but it's an NDP uh, MP who brought that uh, forward, not a conservative, and for good reason. So when we're talking about what actually means, thank you for the question, and I appreciate that. When we're talking about the actual social determinants of our health, um, I, I will think about uh, the health committee has a whole bunch of, uh, found a whole bunch of really interesting things that we need to work on. Like, for example, that there are lower life expectancies for, 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 for bisexual people, for example. And we need to explore why that might just be. So when we're talking about what we need and what our community needs on the ground, we're hearing the stories of people with HIV who can't afford their medication, right? So. We're hearing the stories of LGBTQ2S uh, aging members who can't afford the cost of their blood pressure medication or their insulin. So when, I, when I'm going to door to door and I'm hearing these stories, the number one thing that we could do with, for these people and our communities and all communities across Canada is implement a national pharmacare program. Because we're finding far too many people, 3.2 million Canadians every year are trying to decide, are not filling prescriptions because they can't afford it. 3.2 million Canadians every year. That's unacceptable. So what we actually need on the ground is access to not only the medication, but also we're talking about vaccines in our national program. So we're talking about access to PrEP. We're talking about access to the HPV vaccine. We're talking about access to Twinrex uh, for protection against hepatitis A and B. And these are the kinds of things that our communities need in order to be healthy on an ongoing basis. And I know what that's like to pay out of pocket, because when I decided that I wanted to get Gardasil to protect myself, I had to pay out of pocket. And it was $250 for one dose. And you have to buy three doses over the course of a, uh, of a year in order, to, in order to inoculate yourself for that. So when we're talking about our communities and our health and what we need, we need to implement National Pharmacare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have to say I'm very impressed with all of you keeping to time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so uh, the next um, community organization representative we have is from Fierte Canada Pride, Haran Vijayanathan. So uh, thank you for the organization. and thank you for the opportunity to ask a question on behalf of Fear Take Canada Pride. Uh, so Fear Take Canada Pride is a national association of prides in Canada. We have over 70 members from every province and territory, and our members in big cities and small towns are vital parts of the 2S LGBTQ plus communities. 
In the past year, the federal government has made a significant pledge to supporting funding for prides in Canada. The funding from the Departments of Heritage, Tourism, and Women and Gender Equality is a recognition of the important cultural, economic, and personal impact prides have in over 130 communities across Canada. If elected, would your government commit to continuing this funding, and what, if any, perspective does your party have on supporting prides and 2S LGBTQ plus cultural events in the north, rural areas, and two-spirit indigenous communities? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Ryan, let's start with you this time. Sure, this is a, a great question because when I moved to the city, Pride Toronto was one of my first jobs after community living Ontario <clears throat> and community living Toronto. You have to excuse me, I have a terrible cold coming on and if uh, I get my facts out of order, Brian, I do apologize. I, I didn't mean to say that it was a conservative MP, it was a, definitely an NDP MP that brought that forward. So, um, Pride for me, you know, is, is something that I look fond on in the past. I, I was the director of development at Pride for almost five years here in Toronto, and then played a role in, the, it was the early stages of uh, Canada Pride. I was on the bid team that went to Florida, of all places, to bid for World Pride in 2014. I had moved on to Olivia Chow's campaign for mayor, where, where Brian and I met, actually, uh, by the time World Pride hit the, the streets of Toronto, but nonetheless, uh, I do support investing in uh, LGBTQ2 culture, heritage, and arts. I think it's, it's vitally important. In 2009, when I was at Pride Toronto, it was actually the Conservative government. I was a Liberal at the time, so I, I didn't give them any credit then, but it seems only fair now to say that it was the Conservative government in the 2008 economic downturn that invested in Prides across the country for the first time, which was a bold move for them back then, I'll recognize. I don't make excuses for everything that they have in their record when it comes to the LGBTQ2 community, not by a long shot. But this was a recognition of the economic impact that the community had in terms of tourism for events like Pride. And so the Marquee Tourism event program was one of a kind, and it gave Pride Toronto its first big splash of federal money over $400,000 that year. And so while I absolutely support investing in LGBTQ2 heritage rights, uh, arts and culture, that comes with a bit of a caveat. I don't support the ongoing ban of and discrimination against uniformed Toronto police officers. I think because we have used pieces of legislation like anti-discrimination policies to get where we are, we can't cherry pick when it's inconvenient. Inclusion is very difficult and we have to find a way to all be together under the same banner as we march down and Toronto and Young Street. That's your time. We have to cut you off. Together. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's your time. Um, okay, uh, Rob, why don't we go to you? Ryan, I have no doubt about your personal sincerity and your personal involvement in these issues, but you are running for a party that has systemically and systematically <laughs> fought gay rights every step of the way. You folks, you can't, you can't tell me that you support pride. In 2008, you had a, a minority situation where liberals and NDP and Bloc Québécois got together and told the government they had to do it or they would be defeated. That was the opposition that did that, not the Conservatives. And when Diane Ablonsi wanted to extend it further, and I praise Diane, she was criticized and ridiculed and lost her job over pride. She lost her job because her party did not support. They still have a leader who has never attended a Pride event, a Pride parade, or anywhere where I think known gay, lesbian, and bisexual, transgender people are there because who knows what's going to happen to them. Our Prime Minister has not only marched in every Pride parade and across the country has done this, he, we have funded, we have promised 10 million new dollars going forward and we're doing that for a gal, for Pride, small Pride, big Pride. My best Pride is always in Regina and Saskatoon. They have fun. Toronto's good, you should see Saskatoon. Thank you. Um, and just a reminder, folks, we just need to, want, I want to give the candidates all an opportunity to speak, so I just would ask that you keep the applause to the end. Thank you. Um, Nikki. 
Uh, in 2010, I was uh, seconded to the community advisory panel headed by uh, Brent Hawkes and a bunch of other people, I think, and of course Mike Weir, uh, Doug Kerr's partner. Um, during that process, we conducted thousands of interviews, talked to uh, tens of thousands of people, many people who are in this room right now, and got a really clear idea of what the ideal would be for the Pride organizations. And we came up with a very, very long and very, very comprehensive report, the CAP report, which I'm proud to have co-authored. And all of the recommendations in there still stand to this day. I will also throw into this, there's another idea that one of the challenges Pride has to face, and I'm very interested in helping find a solution to this, is to distinguish, distinguish between a festival organization and an advocacy organization. Back in 2010, I was told at meetings that we don't need to march anymore because it's all been done. We've got gay marriage, we've got everything else. And say, whoa, 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 what about trans rights? What about two-spirit rights? What about intersex rights? What about people who aren't blessed to live in this very, 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 very tiny part of Canada and the rest of Canada that face discrimination on a regular basis? So yes, I am very much in favor of supporting uh, Pride in the context of the CAP report and helping them come to a more active, more advocacy-based way of doing things, as well as having a good time. Thank you. Brian, over to you. Thank you. I think the question is really important. Pride is such an important core part of our, our community. It's an act of, constant act of defiance. It's incredibly political, and it's necessary for us to constantly stand up. But what we don't need is for the liberals to play with this, like, like dangle it in front of us and, 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 and hold funding in front of us and tell us what to do with it. It really needs to be about our community standing up for the things that our community wants. And Pride, it is absolutely essential that we're listening to our community and paying attention to that. I've been to Prides right across Ontario in, in North Bay just had their, had their very first Pride. I mean, there are communities that are having them in Belleville, Thunder Bay. It is beautiful, but we have to recognize that, that really our community here in Toronto has a very unique part to play in, in setting the national kind of agenda and the ideas of what's going on in our communities. And what we saw was that the provincial government cut funding to Pride Toronto simply because they wanted the police to be back in the parade. They didn't care what the community wanted. They didn't care to consult with the community. They wanted to mandate, put the community in, you'll get your money. And Pride Toronto said no. So what we actually need to pay attention to here is that Bill Morneau then showed up into this community and he dangled the money in front of the community and then he had a nice press release with everybody standing behind him in the 519. So that isn't how we build community. That isn't how we pay attention to how our community works. That isn't how pride works. Our pride should be grassroots. It should be involving the people that are around here. It should involve all of our different communities, including uh, the LGBTQ2S plus and trans and intersex and all of these different components because it is a political act and it must continue to be so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, just a reminder uh, for people who are watching this um, via live stream, they can comment on Facebook and we'll get some questions added a bit later on. And also if any folks in the room have some questions, uh, just uh, wave at Erica Lenti, who's down here. Um, she will pass you a piece of paper and a pen. You can write the question down and it'll get passed to me. Um, and now I wanna bring up to the stage from the Dignity Network, Kareem Ladakh. So what a wonderful audience we have. People are standing on the, like, all around on the stairs and, anyway, thank you very, very much. I am uh, with the Dignity Network and the Dignity Network is a coalition of 48 organizations across the country interested in advancing Canada's support of LGBTI human rights globally. Today the network is releasing a set of 19 recommendations, which I casually threw that way, to all the parties on how Canada can continue to increase its support for LGBTI human rights around the world and do more to support LGBTI refugees globally. Before I ask my question, I just want to preface it. It means a lot to me. I've lived in 10 countries. I've traveled to a ton more. I have seen and met people in those countries who I look at and I go, I don't have an answer for you why Canada is not doing more. That's my personal comment. My question is, if elected, how will your government ensure that Canada continues to support LGBTI human rights around the world? 
Canada's development assistance sits at just 0.28% of gross national income, which is still below the average of 0.32% of gross national income invested by other OECD countries and far below the UN target of 0 0.70. What measures will your government take to bolster international assistance for LGBTI communities internationally? And so we will hand out those recommendations to you now. They are being handed out in all of the five town halls that we're having across the country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kareem. Uh, Brian, let's start with you. Sure. Thank you so much for that question, Kareem. So um, we are committed to the 0.7%. The NDP is, in, is, is committed to that. So if we're thinking about what the Liberal government provides now, it's only 0.26% of GDP is actually going towards international assistance. And that was even more dismal under the Conservatives prior to that. So the NDP is committed to increasing that. And we want it to go to things like uh, promotion of uh, gender rights and equality right across the world. We're talking about HIV AIDS prevention across the world. We're talking about our international uh, humanitarian commitments and that's absolutely essential to the work that we're doing. But we're also talking about uh, how do we look at uh, the immigration but also the, the refugee and asylum uh, seeking streams which is so important. And this is a loaded question that we can't get to in, 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 in fully over the course of this uh, short period. But what I, what I will say is we only have Nationally, there are only 3,500 spaces annually that are, are that are mandated for humanitarian uh, for for humanitarian uh, need for refugees that are coming to this country, and 3,500 is not very much if you think about it in terms of that. We have so many organizations in very much need, and what that looks like on the ground is when I was canvassing just a couple weeks ago with two trans teenagers, uh, we encountered a trans refugee that was in the village. And that was just so amazing for a moment. Like, I still get tingles just thinking about it because I had two amazing volunteers talking about the importance to fight for trans rights here in Canada and why it was so important that we created the space so that other trans refugees could come here and be protected and feel safe, have access to gender confirming surgeries and be the full people that they are. So absolutely the NDP will stand for that and I promise to fight for that along with uh, the very many uh, LGBTQ2S plus uh, candidates right across the country. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much. Uh, <coughs> Nikki, Nikki can I pull you in now? Sure. Um, uh, I met a trans refugee early this afternoon and uh, she was in the park just up the road uh, suffering from tremendous mental health and drug addiction issues. Um, I don't have to go knocking on doors and I certainly wouldn't dream of speaking for trans rights without having a great deal more experience than, than you do. Having said that, uh, I am in agreement and my party is in agreement with uh, a, a more uh, comprehensive way to support LGBTI refugees. That includes, of course, making absolutely certain that we do business with other countries that respect our charter of rights and freedom. And one of the challenges when you look at a global map and you see these are the places where you can, you can marry, these are the places where you can't marry, maybe you can, common spouse, common law. The fact of the matter is there are a large number of places on the planet where for some of us, it is a death sentence just to get off the plane. And we should not, and we must not be doing business with these people. That's the long and the short of it. I can't believe that we send our uh, dollars to people who routinely murder or, uh, or persecute LGBT people. Why are we doing this? This is surely not what Canada is all about. When people come here as refugees, of course, we should acknowledge that <laughs> these are terrible places to live and this may be a slightly better place to live but we should make sure that those refugees also understand, whether they're LGBT or not, that this is a, this is a, a country of inclusion and that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms must be respected by all. We've just got to stop doing business with terrible people. That's my position. Thank you. Uh, Rob? Thank you for the question. And uh, it, it are, it, there are several questions embedded in there. One is on international assistance, which is uh, both development uh, funding as well as uh, disaster and relief assistance funding and refugee sponsorship and all that stuff. The, with respect to refugees, let's get this clear. In 2018, Canada took the number one position in the world for the most refugee sponsorships in the world. Over 30,000 refugees were accepted into Canada out of 90,000 that were resettled 
out of the, frankly, close to 30 million. So Canada isn't number one per capita, which we used to be. We're number one in absolute terms, and that is the work of the Trudeau government. And we have committed to refunding Rainbow Refuge programs across the country in Vancouver, Ottawa, Toronto, and other places as they develop. We'll continue to do that. Canada needs refugees, not only because of humanitarian reasons, but because we're a better country after they arrive. That's why we do it. On, with respect to international assistance, um, the People's Party, thank goodness they're not here, has promised to slash to zero, to zero funding for international activity. The Conservative Party is slashing it by 25%. 25% of an already too small budget. Charity begins at home, yes, but it doesn't end at home. It goes into the world. And we are doing that through active partnerships with churches, with civil society groups. We are building that. We inherited a disastrous uh, legacy from the Conservative government, Mr. Harper. We have rebuilt our reputation around the world. We are investing in community groups through the Canada Fund, and we are continuing to do that. We will be proud to be Canadians wherever we travel That's with the time. Liberal government. Thank you. And Ryan. Well, and we'll be inheriting a disaster of our own, Rob, so I guess the this, this score is even. When it comes to the 25% reduction, it's not in immigration, it's in uh, foreign aid assistance. Mm -hmm. That's two totally different things. Well, and there's, no, you said immigration. No, no. No, I didn't. Oh, well, my mistake. I find it, uh, to go back to your previous point uh, about how proud you are to be marching and how proud you are that our Prime Minister has been marching in our pride parades and making it all about him. Uh, I wonder, you know, as we send a beacon to the world about how inclusive we are, what do our LGBT refugees think when they see Canada and they say, I'd like to go live there, and the Prime Minister, the only Prime Minister in our country's history, is the only Prime Minister to have broken our ethics laws and to have admitted to wearing something as atrocious as blackface. So that's what people have to sit with. This is not just one or two indiscretions related to his personal life or his government policy. When it comes to standing up on the world stage, Mr. Scheer has criticized Brunei's introduction of the death penalty, as my colleague from the Green Party already pointed out. The world is a very dangerous place for us, and we all need to be standing up and taking a stand against the death penalty and other discriminatory measures across, across the globe. Conservatives have made large steps when it comes to the world stage on protecting LGBTQ2 rights, including... Folks, including, folks, please, enough, folks. Including committing to increasing the ratio of LGBTQ2 refugees into our country, while also permanently establishing the Rainbow, Rainbow Refugee Assistance Program. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I just want to remind people, please, to refrain from the boos or the cat calls or the applause during this conversation. All of the folks up here on this stage have come to talk about these issues, and you might disagree, and that is fine, but please, please be respectful of the folks on this stage. Thanks. Um, before I bring up um, the next uh, community organization uh, uh, representative, do we have any questions from um, the audience or via our, our Facebook? They're still vetting. Okay, great. Um, and just to remind everybody, if you are posting on social media about this, it is hashtag proud vote. So I want to move on to the next community representative. It's uh, from the Canadian, uh, it's the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, uh, Daryl Sherman. So the CGLCC is Canada's LGBT plus Chamber of Commerce, representing a broad coalition of LGBT plus owned businesses, corporations, and professionals. Our core mission is to contribute to a thriving and inclusive Canadian economy by promoting economic growth and prosperity, in particular through supplier diversity certification, expanding global trade opportunities, and young entrepreneur mentorship. The economic impact of Canada's LGBT plus business community is vast and growing. It is estimated 
that one out of every 40 Canadian businesses is LGBT owned and operated and that they are contributing nearly $200 billion each year to the Canadian economy. Yet LGBT entrepreneurs are underrepresented in the corporate and public supply chain and face barriers to scaling their businesses. So my question, if elected, what would your government do to further support the development and expansion of LGBT plus owned businesses domestically and globally and ensure that LGBT plus owned businesses have equal access to procurement opportunities in order to contribute fully to the Canadian economy. Thank you so much, Daryl. Um, Nikki, I don't know if we've started with you yet, so why don't we start with you? Uh, I joined the uh, Canadian Gay Lesbian Chamber of Commerce back in 2004 when I had the lofty title of Media Goddess at Fab Magazine. Uh, so I'm familiar with your organization. Um, at the risk of being facetious or making a joke about something very, very serious, I think when it comes to procurement, uh, we need to uh, buy people from who are literally and figuratively friendly towards us. I, for example, think we should only buy oil from people who do not execute gays. That's a pretty radical idea, perhaps, for you, but I think that's where we might wish to start. I'd also like to suggest that we focus on employing people who up until very, very recently have not had a full slate of human rights. Again, I'm talking about trans people, but others who, in our case, we have not had federal human rights at the charter level uh, uh, since uh, until uh, 2016. So we face in our uh, community huge levels of unemployment and huge levels of poverty. So I'd encourage you to encourage your businesses to employ more people in the area. As to procurement, the government buys an awful lot of things. And why we buy things from people who are, uh, are not our natural allies, and by allies I'm talking about LGBT allies, is quite frankly beyond me. Uh, we buy billions and billions of dollars of things, and we need to be buying them from people who share our values and our view of freedom and civil liberties. We've just got to stop doing it straight away. This is part of Nikki Ward's uh, point of view, but it's also part of the Green Party platform, uh, so which you can see online. I'm not making this stuff up. And the other virtue is that our party, party does not have a whip. And so we're not faced with these terrible situations where a candidate is forced to vote against their um, uh, their conscience or their constituents. And so that is how the Green Party differs significantly in meeting the, those kind of things that you're describing. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Ryan. Yeah. So I support and will fight for the objectives of the Canadian um, Chamber of the Canadian Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce, it's always a mouthful, CGLCC. Um, Daryl and I both know that uh, this country's small businesses make up almost two-thirds of the total private labor force. Uh, and so we know that launching, growing, sustaining, uh, and making opportunities available for LGBTQ2 plus entrepreneurs is going to be underpinned by a strong and thriving small business strategy. Justin Trudeau's never-ending tax hikes Carbon tax, increases to CPP and EI premiums, increased personal income tax rates for entrepreneurs and changes to the small business tax rate are going to drastically and negatively affect that approach. And let's not forget their attack on small businesses. It hasn't been that long ago. Despite an uprising from mom and pop shops, small businesses, perhaps some of whom were LGBTQ2 identified. Across this country, Justin Trudeau, Bill Morneau, and Let's throw in Rob Oliphant as well. Steamrolled ahead for months, claiming that business owners were just rich tax cheats. So again, for me, because I supported this government last time, I believe the things they were saying. Fool me once, shame on me, but fool me again, well, you know what they say. I'm, I hope you join me in seeing this liberal government for being the sham and the falsehood that it is, that they will say absolutely anything to get elected. They'll say that they'll reduce the debt. They'll say that they'll reform our electoral process. They'll say that they'll ban conversion therapy. They'll say that they'll be a champion for the environment while authorizing the release of eight billion liters of untreated sewage into the St. Lawrence River and putting a tax on carbon. A carbon tax is not an environmental plan. We all know that well enough. That's, that's your time. Um, Rob, I suspect you might want to jump in now. Let's talk about the record on this. Uh, let's talk about small business first. Um, in general terms, I, I don't know where Ryan got his figures from. We have dropped, 
We inherited a small business tax of 11%. We have dropped it to 9%. It's the lowest small business tax of the G7 countries. We actually believe in small businesses, we're investing in them, and we're, we're doing that also with LGBTQ uh, businesses. In 2017, we announced $100,000 for LGBTQ travel for Destination Canada to, to make sure that we have gay and lesbian, bisexual, transgendered tourism opportunities. In 2018, we co-sponsored with the Chamber the first trade mission which went to Philadelphia, I believe, and uh, the, it was the first time a government of Canada has actually worked with the Chamber to go to a, a national show in Philadelphia, an international show now in Philadelphia to do that work. That costs money, it costs time, but it's because we're investing in small business. We believe in that. We have earmarked $58 million over the next two years for small businesses that are engaged in tourism and travel. One of the five categories is LGBTQ businesses. So this is not emptiness, this is actual work that has been done in the last uh, four years. Are we finished? No. Do we have more work to do? Absolutely. But the partnerships, whether it's on procurement, whether it's on uh, futurepreneurs, whether it's on women entrepreneurs, those kinds of issues are at the core of the DNA of what it means to be liberal. We, we want to invest in business. Absolutely, there were, there were ideas floated by Mr. Morneau and after we were elected around small businesses. Believe me, I took it on very seriously with about two dozen other MPs. We're a party that listens. We got about 80% of those rolled back and we did it because we're a democratic party and we'll continue to do it. That's your time, thank you. And Brian, over to you. Thank you very much for the question. So to go back to procurement, which is what we were talking about, we're right. talking, the <coughs> NDP is talking about uh, implementing uh, a national corporate social responsibility um, requirement for all companies. So when we're, we're talking about working internationally, that they would, we would need strong made in Canada kind of targets for people to maintain uh, and, and be able to live up to when they're negotiating with international contracts. And it means that we won't be selling uh, arms, for example, to uh, Saudi Arabia. It means we won't sell arms to organizations uh, or, or, or countries that have human rights abuses. Um, and I'm gonna talk for a moment because there's probably a queer dairy farmer somewhere out there in the world. Like supply management is very important to protect. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and that is something that we're seeing when it comes to international trade, what we're actually seeing is actually uh, not a protection of Canadian goods, not a protection of made in Canada goods, we're actually seeing is that, that international standards are trying to tear apart uh, what Canada has to offer uh, and, and diminish what, uh, what our standards are here and, and in order to make them more amenable for, for market abroad. And I think that that's something that we should stand up against. Now to the question on small business, which I appreciate, um, Angela McEwen, who is an economist, former economist with the, with the CCPA and now the CLC is the candidate in Ottawa West Nepean, and she said it really well that small businesses often, th we often think of them purely in terms of tax, but what we should be thinking about is, that is small businesses in terms of people. And the number one thing that we can do for small business owners and the people who work for them is provide extended health care to cover the cost of their eye care, dental care, mental health care, uh, to cover the cost of their hearing care, to cover the cost of their medication. If we can keep people healthier in the jobs that, that they're creating and, and participate in this $2 billion of LGBTQ2S uh, businesses right across the country, we can keep them healthier, we can keep our community is healthier, we can keep those businesses healthier, and I think that's better for everybody, and that's what the NDP will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so before we get to uh, the next representative um, from EGAL Canada, um, this is a question, I don't know if it's from somebody on Facebook or if it uh, came from someone in the room, uh, Monica Forrester, thank you for the question. Uh, Facebook, from Facebook. Um, hi, Monica. Um, so the question is, uh, what is your party's stance on safe injection sites um, and the deaths due to the fentanyl crisis? Uh, so why don't we start uh, Rob, with you. We are absolutely in favor of safe injection sites. We actually wa have, have developed protocols for developing more and more of them. The fentanyl opioid crisis in Canada is, is, I think if people were dying at the rate of anything else in this country, it would be seen as a national emergency, a national crisis. But because of so many of them being from marginalized and racialized communities, and because those who aren't are in the closet, as, as it were, we have not spent nearly enough time 
energy, money, or our talents on this project uh, of, of finding a way to reduce deaths in Canada. We absolutely have to have not, I, I, I'm out there on the record, so I'm going to say it already. I believe we should decriminalize drugs. I believe <laughs> it's not yet my party policy. I'll be very clear about that. Uh, but I have looked at this, and, and it has been too long that we have made it a judicial criminal issue. It needs to be seen as a medical issue. It needs to be seen as something that is done between people and their physicians, their primary health care workers, nurses, street nurses. Those are the professionals that need to be involved in this, not police officers. I did a round table on it in my own writing. I brought together experts who are from the police, from uh, treatment centers, from CAMH. They all agreed. We are, we are needing to push public opinion on this. We need to get you involved. This is not just starting with us on the, on the stage, it's starting with you in the chairs to get Canadians to talk about this problem, to find a way to, to move it away from criminal justice into the hands of people who can handle it, who can help. Too many lives are being lost. Thank you. Uh, Brian. Uh, thank you very much for, for that question. I think it's really important. And this is a moment when we're going to make it very local. Because let's be very clear, this riding is the epicenter of the opioid crisis here in Toronto and in Ontario. And we're seeing this right across the country. It's also an issue that my colleague Jenny Kwan is dealing with in Vancouver East. And it really is a national public health emergency. And while Rob will say wonderful things, they are not the position of the Liberal Party. And that is very important to pay attention to. It is not the position of the Liberal Party. What New Democrats have been trying is we have long called this a national public health emergency. We are approaching 15,000 deaths associated with the opioid crisis. We need to treat it as such. So uh, a few months ago, um, Senator Gustavo Rivera, who is the chair of the health committee in uh, New York State Senate, uh, came up to Toronto. And he met with a whole bunch of different progressive leaders here because they wanted to see what it would be like to, to implement the, uh, a safe injection site, safe consumption, harm reduction approach here. They cannot do that in New York. It is illegal, which means that people are just dying everywhere. They're dying inside of McDonald's. They're dying inside uh, of uh, coffee shops. They're dying on the streets. They're dying in parks. They're dying alone. And that is absolutely what we need to prevent. So when we're talking about taking a harm reduction approach, it means that we cannot incarcerate ourselves out of the issue. It means that we need to treat it as a public health emergency and put the money behind it. There's a reason why we call it an emergency, because we put the money behind it. We put the resources behind it. And then we make sure that people are staying alive, that we have access to safe supply that we are talking about decriminalization, that we are making sure that we are not trying to incarcerate ourselves over this problem, that we're not trying to criminalize it and get rid of it that way, and that we're making sure that we have access to uh, the harm reduction framework from the start to the finish uh, so that people are staying alive in our communities because absolutely we're seeing, seeing this uh, tear apart very many communities in Toronto Centre and we have to make sure that we also have representation that shows up at the tables, that brings the stakeholders together, that understands this community, that lives in this community, that sees it on the ground uh, that does their part and shows up. That's your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ryan? So I live in the middle of uh, five safe injection sites located in Toronto Centre uh, near the neighbourhood of Church and, and Dundas streets. I see what people are suffering through on a daily basis and I think that we have to be able to have the courage to have conversations about what pieces of this intervention are working and what pieces about this intervention are not working without being labeled homophobic and racist and against harm reduction of any kind. I wanna say in the clearest possible terms that I support injection sites and that I do believe in the power of harm reduction. It does not go though without making sure that we're not causing harm to the communities where these sites are located. So in, app in applying for a safe injection site to the federal government, the requirements are clear. You have to demonstrate a clear consultation to the community. You have to put together a plan to address the concerns that come forward from community members who are going to be asked to live among and within the people who are in crisis, in full crisis. And so we've seen from the applications that we've received from Health Canada that these community consultations are not as fulsome as they should have been. And they identified very real problems, the kind of problems that we're now seeing playing out across the areas where we can say the epicenter is, but make no mistake about it, it's coming to a neighborhood near you. There is nothing stopping the, the 
progression of this epidemic from reaching the far corners of our city and others. And so to just put our heads in the sand and say, you know what, we can't talk about fixing the problems that we know and see on the street that are associated with injection sites because that just makes you an awful person, or on Twitter it makes you, quote, a supporter of state-sanctioned murder, is not going to help advance anyone's, anyone's rights in this issue. People who are living beside and with the people in crisis have a true compassion, a true sense of wanting to help people your in, time. in this affliction and through it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nikki? It's such a deep question. Firstly, to say that the Green Party in this area, as in frankly all of the other areas we've discussed so far, has been on the right side of history, continues to be on the right side of history, and tends, I, su I suggest, to be the conscience of the parties that are, uh, are represented on this table. Uh, yes, we support the decriminalization of drugs. However, let's also understand that this is a health issue, but let's not put the blame on those who are addicted. Let's recognize this is a societal issue and that poverty is a root cause of mental health and addiction and death, for heaven's sake. And that is something that a federal government has a responsibility to address. We also know where the fentanyl is coming from. We know who and where, who is making it and where it is coming from. And we need to sanction those nations who produce fentanyl in full view of their own government and then export it and export the terrible, terrible suffering and death that goes with it to us. And so to claim that, that there's nothing the federal government cannot do is not true. We can do things very, very rapidly. We know who's making it. We know, <laughs> we know who's making it. <laughs> We've got to stop it coming into the country in the first place. We've got to deal with the root causes, the primary one is, uh, of which is uh, poverty. And yes, we need to have safe injection sites and proper access to recovery thereafter. So I think a comprehensive approach to addiction, mental health, deal with poverty, and stop those buggers bringing it into our country in the first place. And that's something your government could do. Thank you very much. Um, so now I want to introduce from EGAL Canada, Jennifer Boyce. EGAL Canada is a national organization working to advance the rights of LGBTQI2S people through legal advocacy, uh, education, uh, research, and community engagement. Uh, so in Canada, our current criminal code has a section 268-3, which bans female genital mutilation. At the same time, also in Canada, we explicitly allow genital mutilation on intersex children and infants for both cosmetic and function altering reasons. So by allowing these uh, surgeries on intersex children, Canada is in direct violation of the international human rights standards set out by the United Nations. So my question here for you today is, does your party support making necessary amendments to the Criminal Code of Canada to prohibit medically unnecessary surgeries on intersex children? Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Ryan. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, EGAL is another uh, place that has a, a, a nice warm spot in my heart. Uh, I didn't get to say in response to the first question about health and social outcomes, how impressed I was with, and, and can you continue to be, with the interventions that EGAL Canada Human Rights Trust has been able to design and implement across the country, both in education and in preventing crimes against uh, LGBTQ2 identified people. Programs like their Safe for Schools program and report uh, homophobic violence, period. As you know, as you all know, hate crimes motivated against the uh, members of the LGBT community uh, remain the most violent in the country year after year after year. When it comes to intersex rights, uh, I personally support and will fight for the measures required to stop physicians from assigning sex at birth. I don't believe that it's appropriate for a physician with or without parents' consent to be selecting the sexual identity of children um, without their consent, uh, plain and simple. When it comes to the Conservative Party of Canada, the Conservatives don't support any forced participation of a minor or a person who is uh, over the age of majority to undertake or participate in any medical procedure whatsoever, be that 
uh, clinical or therapeutic. So the party doesn't support it. I, I surely don't support it. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Nikki. Well, again, slam dunk on this one. Just go to the website. We're 100% uh, on board with this. And by the way, I've also had great experiences with their gal and their practical assistance in trans and intersex rights. And I remember they paid for my train fare to go to Ottawa because I couldn't afford it to go and present my case to Hedy Fry, who I understand is doing one of the other um, uh, debates. Uh, the, not only do I support it, but I've marched alongside and fought for it uh, physically uh, on, on many, many occasions. And you're absolutely right. To describe this as genital uh, mutilation is absolutely correct. Now, many people who identify as intersex do not identify also as members of the LGBT uh, family. Uh, so we have to be mindful uh, of that. But um, again, you know, I'm not convinced by the, uh, frankly, anything I've heard to the right of me here in terms of uh, the, the freedom. This is really, uh, we have seen nothing but um, just horrendous action from various right-wing governments over the years. And uh, there is no reason, reasonable uh, reason for mutilating a child. It's just, it's unconscionable that we still do this as a matter of practice. I frankly think that the federal government might, should, if at all possible, strike um, uh, physicians who do this off the register. They shouldn't be allowed to practice medicine, let alone touch children. Thank you. Uh, Rob. For 25 years, I worked as a United Church of Canada minister. And uh, one of the, the great, you know, we, we go through joys and sorrows with families in that role. And always, obviously, one of the great joys a family goes through is the birth of a child. And I imprinted on my mind is still uh, a family that was part of my congregation who had a, a child, a new baby, and they were by the physicians forced to choose the gender, the sex of their child, and they were given only a few days to make that decision. That's wrong. That is utterly wrong. And we will do everything we can to make sure that at the federal government level, we do what is absolutely right to respect the natural development of people into the, the, the binary gender of their choice or the non-binary gender of their choice as they grow older. That is absolutely what we need to do. And that is part of a whole package. And, and we're, we're taking small steps on that. In 2017, uh, we took an interim measure of allowing people to put X um, on passport applications and other federal government documents. We made that permanent in 2019 so that for the first time in Canadian history, people could deal with their government in a non-binary way. It's absolutely critical we take those steps. We are going to be continuing to do them. That is to respect gender expression and gender identity. When that came to adding that and Bill C-16 to the, uh, the Human Rights Act, all the Liberals, all the NDP, the Green, the Bloc Québécois supported it. Half the Conservatives voted against it. Half of them voted against it. And then when it got to the Senate, the whipped conservative senators held it up for almost two years in the Senate. That is that's, not standing with people to make time. sure we have gender expression that's identity that's fair. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I can exhale a little bit. I really wasn't sure what was going to come out of the, the rest of the parties over the course of this. But again, uh, it's, it's an issue with the Conservatives here. This is not, Ryan's personal views are not uh, Andrew Shear's views, unfortunately. And we know that Andrew Shear won't be on the right side of uh, justice on this. So thank you so much for the question. Um, I think it, it is absolutely intolerable that this uh, continues to happen. But what we actually would do, uh, and what I would advocate for as an NDP MP coming from Toronto Centre, uh, would be to, to ensure that we have a national health standard that right across the entire country, all doctors would have somewhere to refer to uh, if they were to see this uh, uh, be presented with an intersex child and, and a standard for figuring out what is the next step forward. Um, because it, it's, I'd not tr it, it's not something that we need to deal with at the criminal code. It should not be there at all that we should be even thinking about criminal prosecution for this issue. It really is a health issue that we need to work with with doctors to ensure that they know the best, uh, the best approach to this that preserves the right um, of, of, of the family, the child, and then also recognizing that there are, there's non-binary, that there are, there's many different, uh, different, different parts to, to, to the biological sex of a, of a child that cannot be determined easily by 
arbitrary assignments of centimeters, right? Like this is what it's coming down to, arbitrary assignments of centimeters, and that's unacceptable that we should be making up decisions of people's gender based on that. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Um, uh, we've got four questions left. Is everyone doing okay? Good, okay. So I want to bring forward from Proud Politics, Chris Matthews. Sorry, I should have given you more warning. You were at the back. I should have given you like a longer, like some music or something. <laughs> well, thanks for having us. Um, Proud Politics is a national organization that's devoted in their mission to increase the number of um, LGBTQ plus representation in all levels of government. Um, data does show that greater representation in government actually translates to better policies that affect our community. Uh, Proud Politics is a nonpartisan organization that supports candidates through all parties and candidates who are not in a party. So my question to all of you is, uh, although, um, sorry. <laughs> although uh, over the several years there's has been inc uh, there has been several LGBTQ plus um, elected to uh, government, um, the number of uh, MPs, uh, federal MPs have been stagnant. Um, and uh, in translation to the fact that the size of parliament has increased, proportionately the number of out queers MPs have declined. So what do you see as the central hurdles preventing the progress of electing more uh, queer MPs and is there opportunities to do things across party lines? Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to get a little plug in for extra again here. Um, we've been tracking all the LGBTQ2 candidates who are um, running for office, the ones who are publicly out. Um, and so you can find a list of them um, on our website. So um, let's start with you, Brian, on this question. Thank you very much, Chris, for the question. I think it matters. Representation matters. And it's one of the reasons why I'm running here as a queer racialized man who lives with a disability in this riding, Toronto Centre. So it comes down to um, the NDP has the, has the most diverse set of candidates of any political party in Canadian history, and that's really something to think about. There are 80 racialized candidates, the most of any, any party anywhere. Um, there are 40 LGBTQ2S uh, identified uh, members of the, of, uh, candidates right across the country. and But it's really important to talk about the fact that we're not just running in places that we have no hope in winning. We're running in places like downtown Toronto. I'm running here in Toronto Centre, the very home of uh, the very home of the queer village here in, in, in Toronto. Um, Diana Yoon is running in, in Spanish Fort York, just south of here, and they're riding just south of here. Lori Campbell is running in a two-spirited uh, member who's running in, in, in Waterloo. It matters, and it's one of the reasons why I decided to stand up, because when I can see people like Diana reflected in the politics that I'm looking for, when I can see myself reflected in, in candidates right across the country who are fighting for the same things that I do, who are saying the same things that I'm doing, who have the track record of fighting for the same things that I do, I know that our communities will be stronger with NDP representatives who come from our community, who have our lived experience, and who will never shy, or shy down or back down from fighting for everyday people and representation matters 100% of the time. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll go to Ryan next. Yeah, as an LGBTQ2 uh, identified candidate in this election, I also felt it was important to run because I, I believe that representation matters and we have a long way to go to make sure that we get representatives at, uh, in Ottawa that truly reflect, reflect the makeup of our community. There are a couple barriers, I think, to this. Uh, the nature of the nomination process as you've seen it play out across the major parties and across the ones that are you know, not so major, can be a real serious challenge for people. I mean, you, you can see in the media reports of nomination contests that were not so open and not so transparent. And so when you wanna have, when you wanna talk about open and democratic processes, you have to really look at the parties and see which ones have nominated their candidates in open, fair, and democratic processes. And which ones have kind of favored in, you know, Olympians that paddle canoes. I will say that there are other elements that hold people back from getting involved, and some of them have to do with the tone of the campaign. Of all the promises that this uh, Prime Minister has broken, if you go back about six or seven months before we were talking about the RIP period, he made one promise, and this is one that he has been sure to keep. He said this election is going to be quote unquote nasty. And I think that has a real 
tone problem with people, especially young people, who want to get involved in politics. They, they take a look at the kind of rhetoric they're seeing on TV and in the news. My party's just as guilty as it, although I'll say not as much as the ones who have been leading it over to my left. Uh, but it is a problem overall. <laughs> Let's skip over to the far, far left, and I think in this way that's appropriate well, the far, measure. Far left is over there, actually. Well, these days it's hard to tell. <laughs> I mean, they're out competing each other for as far left as they can go. I like to think about having representatives from the LGBT community as part of the Conservative Party as we strive to be more in the middle. I think I would identify more as a red Tory, and I think that's the kind of coalition we're building here in Toronto Centre. Thank you. Thank you. Nikki? Uh, yeah, nonsense. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the fact of the matter is that the... No, not, not just from you, from you too. Uh, <laughs> the barrier to entry for those of us who are marginalized is very, very, very high. And there's a reason I'm running as an out candidate for the Green Party, because they asked me to. And there's a reason in Toronto, of the 25 uh, ridings, six of them are uh, people who identify as LGBT, and not just broadly, frankly, privileged males, but genderqueer, uh, feminized people. Or, and we have another trans person that's running here, and Tara down front here, bless you, and her wife. I mean, this is representative. The trouble is that for those of us who want to engage in advocacy, there's no room for us in any of your parties. I was tired of being tokenized, to be quite frank. The only way to get policy forward is to be part of the process, not just added on afterwards and wheeled out on a gurney like, a, what is it, Hannibal Lecter, and oh, here's the trans person. No, actually there when policies are being made. And there were no opportunities to do that in your party, much though I like you personally, Rob. So the Green Party, is the place for those of us who are committed and see that there is still more to be done. Are you kidding? We've done almost nothing so far. There is so much to be done. And the Green Party is a place where all of you can participate in it. So, um, yeah, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. This, if, if I got elected, I would be one of the first trans people to be elected anywhere in North America. That's not underrepresentation. That's non-representation. That's why we got to do this Green Party thing. Thank you. I'm in the unusual position of being elected um, in the, by representation, the gayest riding in Canada. Don Valley West is the gayest representative riding in Canada. We're represented by a lesbian, Kathleen Wynne, and an out gay man as the Member of Parliament. And it is not the epicenter of gay activity in Canada. Don Valley West is not known for its gay bars, its gay restaurants. <laughs> what it's known for is its diversity. And it gives me a chance to talk about some of the barriers and also some of the gifts. I represent the largest Muslim riding in Canada. Think about that. By percentage, it's the largest Muslim riding in Canada. Muslims have been vilified as being homophobic time and time again. They've embraced Kathleen Wynne and me because they've seen in us people who, while we're people of privilege, have been marginalized in our own ways and we will stand with that community. And that's the way we need to enter into politics, to say that every single person has an identity of being left out in some way. And when we own our own outness, when we engage in it, we bring other people in. And we, we do that, and it's tough. Politics is tough. When I watched Mr. Shear's opening remarks at the debate last night, I cringed. He didn't take two seconds opportunity to offer a vision. He simply smeared and attacked his main opponent. That's not what politics is about. And most LGBTQ people have had enough of that. We've grown up with bullying. We've grown up with people putting us down. And we're tired of it. So I think there's a natural tendency for us not to want to put our hats in places or in, into arenas where we're going to be bullied again. Something's wrong with me. Um, I, I do it. I have today, today I had a door slammed in That's my face by a woman who opened the door and said, I'm a Christian, so That's I can't your, vote for you. That's your time. Sorry. Think about that one for a minute. Sorry, that was your time. Um, thank you. Um, I want to move on to our next representative, um, who's making his way up here, uh, from the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, uh, Anthony Johnson. Thank you very much. 
Good evening. People living with HIV can still be prosecuted for aggravated sexual assault for not disclosing their HIV status to sexual partners. This can happen even in cases there was little or no risk of transmitting HIV. Under the law, a person engaging in consensual sex that causes no harm can be treated like a violent rapist. Approximately 200 people across Canada have already been charged. Some new policies for Crown attorneys have put some limits on prosecutions, but these do not go far enough. We need changes to the criminal code to end unjust prosecutions, as recommended in June by the House of Commons Standing Committee on Justice and Human Rights. And the question, will your party support reforms to the criminal code that remove HIV non-disclosure from the law of sexual assault? And will your party support reforms to limit any prosecutions to cases of intentional and actual transmission of HIV? Thank you so much. Um, Rob, let's start down at the end. Yes. Okay. Maybe I'll go on a little bit more. The answer is an absolute yes. And we did it, we've done it in steps. We will acknowledge we've not finished it yet. We did it by a directive to the prosecutorial staff across the country to, to find a way around the, the current law to make sure that we are being smart. What is happening here, and we have the first Minister of Health in Canada, and one of the first around the world, who stood with a sign that says, you equals you. And that is an absolutely, when I saw, I mean, I was proud the day the, the Prime Minister made uh, the apology in the House. I was proud the day Ralph Goodale, the Minister of Public Safety, announced that we would, we would uh, uh, purge records of, of uh, crimes that were now considered not to be criminal activity. And I was most proud when Jeanette Pettipot Taylor, the Minister of Health who comes from New Brunswick, stood up and said, you equals you. It is absolutely critical to change the mindset of people to, to use science and to understand that undetectable is untransmissible. And that needs to be reflected in our health policy, in our social policy, in our attitudes, and in our criminal justice system. So the answer is yes. Okay, uh, Brian. Thank you. Um, so undetectable equals untransmittable. So that's actually the best science. So the fact that we have to keep talking about it or that we need to hear it from the Minister of Health in, in the House of Commons is a little bit problematic because that is the best science if you're listening to uh, what people are saying in our communities. And what we actually need to do is actually treat this as a public health issue. It's not an issue of criminalization, nor should it be. And uh, and New Democrats are, are, are strongly opposed to it being, uh, being prosecuted as, as, as aggravated sexual assault. That's absolutely unacceptable. So what we're talking about, what we can actually do, what we should be working towards is the UN AIDS standard, which is 90-90-90, which is 90% know their status, 90% should be in treatment, and 90% uh, suppression. If we can get to that point, UN AIDS is confident that we can beat HIV AIDS in, around the world, but especially right here in Canada, and we can make sure. We have the healthcare funding, we have the social supports, we can do this with a government who is committed to doing this, and it is not an issue of criminalization, absolutely not. It is an issue of public health, and we want to keep people healthy, and we want people to have great sex, and we want people to be very, uh, not, this should not be an issue of criminalization, absolutely at all. So thank you very much for the question. I hope that the main takeaway from tonight is we want people to have great sex. <laughs> I believe all parties will agree with that. Um, Nikki, over to you. Uh, well, obviously, uh, obviously, I'm very much, and my party is very much in favor of uh, great sex. Uh, I think we should probably finish there. Uh, I would also respectfully remind folks that uh, uh, sex isn't the only means of transmission and that intravenous uh, drug use and uh, the related poverty that we've already talked about is, uh, is probably, I think, you're probably better able to answer this than me, a principal means of transmission. It also kind of circles back to what we were talking about before, the need for federal health care standards uh, uh, in terms of how we approach all of the diseases, includes those that are, are uh, of those uh, like HIV. So uh, criminalizing any disease is, is abhorrent. It's part of, it's clearly something the Green Party is, is, uh, is, on, is on board with in terms of uh, being on the right side of history. And I think also, you know, I've just made a note here is that it speaks to the notion of consent, right? You said it in your, your question. 
you know, we're talking about fully informed consent here between adults. I thought we did that back in 67. I remember picking up a, you gave out a, a dollar coin the other day on that. I remember that. Yeah, I think we did this in 67, was it? 69. 69, sorry, okay. Perfect number. Okay, fair enough. So, yeah, um, on board with this, but also to be mindful of the fact that we need federal health care standards and I guess uh, litigation standards as well around these kind of things too. Great, thanks. Brian. Yeah, I can, I, you'll see a rare moment here tonight where we have universal agreement across the stage um, in believing about the power of great sex, both personally and on behalf of the party. You're comfortable how you looked at me there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, and I'll, go, and I'll go back to something that uh, Rob said earlier and, and take a bit of exception to, no surprise, when he said that uh, Andrew Shear has never been anywhere where a gay person has been known to be. And so I have to say, I have to remind everyone, he's been to the Stampede people. I mean, come on, cowboys in Calgary are not all LGBT, uh, not, not all LGBT. Uh, I have to say again, uh, and I apologize if I sound like a broken record, but this is one more broken promise from my colleague uh, to the very, very, very left, uh, Mr. Rob Oliphant. This was something that was promised in the last election, and Liberals have had many chances to amend the criminal code. We've seen them amend the criminal code for far less. They went out of their way to sneak in a provision to allow for deferred prosecution agreements <laughs> in something that you may recall as the SNC-Lavalin affair. Um, and so if they wanted to really take action on decriminalizing HIV, if you believe, you want to believe the rationale that he gives you for doing it, then why not do it? There were lots of things snuck into that bill that were changes to the criminal code, and if you want to make a change that would positively impact people living with HIV in this country, well, you had your chance. You had many chances, in fact. We know that the, cri the continued criminalization of HIV in this country undermines HIV testing creates a false sense of security for people thinking that the law somehow will protect them from uh, receiving HIV. It contradicts the message that every person is responsible for their own sexual health. And it leads to human rights abuses by increasing the stigma and discrimination faced by people who, who have HIV or who are at risk of HIV. So ask yourself this. For a government so willing to change the law for things that benefit them, why haven't they You're done it in four years for this? That's your time. Thank you. Um, we have two more questions left and we may be able to squeeze in one uh, a, a third um, but I want to get to the representatives of the next community organization which is the Toronto Trans Coalition Project um, and I believe Stephanie Woolley and Davina Hader are here come on up hi I'm Stephanie Woolley um, the Toronto Trans Coalition Project is a coalition of local advocates working to improve the access to the social determinants of health for the trans and non-binary community. We recently released a report, a needs assessment, called From Surviving to Thriving. Our report indicates that despite the presence of uh, trans rights legislation, uh, the trans community still experiences severe discrimination and lags behind others in employment, financial security, housing, education, health, and social inclusion. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Davina Hader, and I'm going to give the question to everybody tonight. Um, in lieu of what uh, Stephanie just said, what do you and your party pledge to do to address the injustice and to lift up trans and non-binary people for full, for full um, economic security and social inclusion into the Canadian society? How will your party support community-based groups like our Trans Coalition Project achieve our goals and meet these needs outlined in our report? Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you, Davina. Um, Nikki. I will tell you, Davina and Stephanie, uh, that I personally pledge, as I have done for the past 20 plus years, that I will fight like a bugger for trans rights. Uh, and uh, that's what I'm doing right now, and that's what you can do by voting for a Green Party candidate. Thank you for that. 
The fact of the matter is you gave a laundry list of issues that we've known about for years. I first participated in the original uh, determin social determinants of health back in 2003 with the Sherman Health Center. And we discovered, surprise, surprise, that people were dying of poverty, dying because they had no access to shelter, dying because they had no access to basic health care. And with respect, we're not talking about fancy stuff here. We're talking about broken legs and certainly broken hearts. I still see people today, despite the fact that it is illegal to discriminate against trans people, I still see many of my sisters dying regularly, frequently, from preventable issues. We're talking about one of the richest nations in the world where people die in abject poverty, where the only way out is self-destruction. Self-determination for many trans people is self-termination. It's ugly, it's ugly, and it keeps on happening despite good men being in power. No, some of these people are okay, but they don't do anything. I'm tired of leadership, I want action. And the biggest action you can take is on October 21st. Vote green and be, at least put a couple of us in there to keep these buggers honest. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Nikki. Uh, Ryan. Yeah, thank you. That's a tough one to follow. <laughs> First, I want to say that, um, that that I fully understand. I think, as best I can, as a as a gay man of privilege who doesn't identify uh, as part of marginalized communities, the the, the plight of uh, trans-identified people in our community. I'm happy to see that important steps have been taken for things that have to do with visibility, like the Trans March, but important changes at a policy level. I mean, it was, um, it was important work at EGAL Canada Human Rights Trust to open a drop-in crisis counseling center that was exclusively dedicated to LGBTQ2 youth in this city. And the, and the parts of the acronym that you know, we saw the most uptake on were trans-identified youth and two-spirit identified youth. These were the kids that were having the toughest time in the mainstream shelter system. These are the ones that were at risk of the highest degrees of violence. These are the ones that often had pets, and so they were unable to uh, even enter mainstream shelter systems, which is why EGAL undertook to pilot the, the drop-in uh, counseling center and then undertake to do a first for the country uh, and the city to build a transitional and emergency housing facility that would be exclusively dedicated to serving homeless LGBTQ2 youth in this city, overrepresented within that community uh, in, in the trans and two-spirit uh, identities. Almost a quarter of all homeless youth on our street identify as part of our community. And that's a really low number. We know it is because of the, the, the degree that the research is collected. In places like New York, it's almost half, one in two. And so this is a real crisis that we have, we have to face. And so I pledge to taking what I've learned about the bodies and the lived experiences of everyone in the LGBTQ2 community, but certainly the ones that I think have the most work still to be done, and that's the, the trans community and, and the two-spirit community, taking Th that's those your voices time. to Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Brian. You going to vote for I might. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the question. And Nikki, I want to thank you for your passion. Uh, it's definitely, it's really important, and it's important for us to see that as other candidates on the stage, and I appreciate that, so thank you. No, you're um, what's but you're also welcome for the experience and the knowledge, not just the passion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But what's, uh, what's, what's important is that I want to be able to meet with you and, then, and, and to take your voices to Ottawa because if I'm your representative or anybody else is your representative, they should be willing to meet with, you, th with, uh, with the trans community, with the project, uh, to hear the recommendations of that report and implement the changes that, that, that would be most beneficial to making, uh, making sure that that community is heard. And I 100% will commit to doing that. What is necessary as well, too, um, from, uh, is really the healthcare, uh, the healthcare commitments that I can make right off the bat. And what we're talking about with Universal Pharmacare is making sure that 
that everybody has access to what they need in order to be uh, to, to be healthy. That they don't have to choose between uh, between rent paychecks and uh, rent on their paycheck or medicine. That they don't have to choose between uh, food and medicine. Uh, that we're making sure that there is expanded healthcare right across the entire country. So we're talking about access to the healthcare that people need in order to live their full lives in the way that they want. So a new Democrat government will absolutely, completely, and 100% support that. And I promise to amplify the voices of the community that are already being being heard, um, <coughs> but making sure that there that there is that uh, that commitment and and, and action and uh, in in Ottawa from from an MP here in Toronto Centre. So thank you very much for the question. Thank you, uh, Rob. Thank you for the the question. And I think we begin with the idea that laws don't change attitudes, but they help shape attitudes. Laws do not stop prejudice, do not stop discrimination, but they put some costs towards it. And Bill C-16, which for the first time embedded in the Canadian uh, Human Rights Code, uh, gender identity and expression, is absolutely a critical thing. And it, it sounds small, adding a couple of words to, to, to that act, but it was critical and it was a hard fight. When I was first elected in 2008, my best friend in the House of Commons, my oldest and longest friend was Bill Sixe, a new Democrat from Vancouver. Bill Sixe is, uh, is still one of my best friends and he put in private members legislation to attempt to do that and twice that happened, it did not get success because we had too many conservatives in the House of Commons. And partisan nonsense between you guys. Sorry? Partisan nonsense. There was some partisan nonsense. However, we were able to finally take that, once we got a majority, and get it done. We got it in done. In 12 short years. In 12 short years, it takes time. <laughs> but it makes a huge difference. Will it change attitudes? No. What needs to go underneath that law is constant and continual programming and activity, like $4.2 million that's going to EGAL to build housing in the city as part of a national housing strategy. That will help trans youth, absolutely. The largest single uh, donation or, or funding that has ever been given to any LGBT group. We're not done yet. It's housing, it's respect, it's stigma, it's health care, it's, it's employment, it's anti-discrimination laws, it's, and we, we put it in Bill C-65 to make sure that it's in the labor uh, code as and well. We're not done yet, but to take criticism from the conservatives because we didn't finish it that's from time, someone who Rob. won't even start it is it's too your time. rich. It's your time. Uh, thank you so much. Um, our last scheduled question um, is uh, from uh, 519 Church Street Community Center. I think that uh, Chi Cheng Wat is here. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the organizers organizing this wonderful town hall across the country. And thank you for all candidates coming this evening. I'm asking question on behalf of the 519 Community Center, an agency of City of Toronto and a nonprofit organization um, serving LGBTQ2S um, communities in the city. So the question is with regards to the housing crisis in major urban centers in Canada and also to the series of provincial budget cuts that impact social programming, including the recent um, cut to Legal Aid Ontario, what will your party do to improve the quality of life, safety, and access to essential services for LGBTQ identified refugees who are fearing violence and persecution in their countries of origin. This is, I know, this is, <laughs> this is a, uh, a, a very tricky uh, court situation here. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for your question. Um, so I'll start at this end and move my way across. Thank you very much for the question. I think it's uh, it's very important. So the, the 519 is a core part of our community. I was I volunteered there many times, um, and I think I, I also sat on the board of directors for the Canadian Environmental Law Association, which is uh, a legal aid clinic who who saw uh, cuts under the Doug Ford government. And what that means is that critical services accessing the legal protections that everybody everybody should have access to uh, for people who can't afford it, they're they're really struggling now. And really, what that means is that a lot of refugees need to find the money they need to 
to beg to get the to get the representation they need in order to have their uh, their particular concerns heard. This comes from a chronic lack of funding at, from liberal and conservative governments over and over again. This is also the issues that we're seeing in terms of settlement programs, which have a lack of funds to help these people resettle is an issue of lack of chronic funding from the Liberals and Conservatives time after time. So when Mr. Oliphant is talking about the fact that 29,500 uh, refugees were brought into the country, or that's the target for 2019, in fact, two-thirds of those are private sponsorship, which means there is almost no federal money at all that goes towards helping these people. And it means that it falls on organizations like the 519 to be able to do that work. It falls on, on church groups. It falls on private communities. What we need is the federal government that comes back to the table. I used to work, I used to be on the, I used to be a peer sex hedge health educator, hard to say, uh, with Asian Community Aid Services. There used to be a settlement program specifically for LGBTQ2S plus South and Southeast and uh, East Asian people that was funded by the federal government. That program was, fut, was cut under Stephen Harper. So we need to go back to the provision of actual programs that come from the federal government. And it's very important also that these programs come away from the churches, that they're not linked directly to a religious experience and is absolutely essential, especially for LGBTQ2S refugees that are coming here, that they are, that they are, that are heard and that they feel welcomed in a non-discriminatory uh, non way. That is your time, thank you. <laughs> go ahead, Ryan. So liberals in Ontario have had a long, 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 long time to address this problem in a meaningful and effective way. And what we've seen is now, after a recent election in this province, a very quick resort to blame the current government for all the problems faced by everyone in this province. And I just don't buy it, I don't think you do either. As part of a federal commitment, as you know, this, this issue crosses federal provincial boundaries, as part of a federal commitment, the Conservative Party of Canada is committed. There's a guarantee. I've signed it. Every candidate across the country has signed it. To increasing the spending from federal governments to provinces by 3% each and every year for social and education programs. As you know, what happens to that money when it reaches the provincial level, we don't always have uh, a hand in controlling. But I'm confident that it will go where it needs. When it comes to the housing crisis in this city, it's no laughing matter. I mean, we can make jokes about partisan, provincial, interprovincial, and federal provincial relations, and you know, sometimes I think they're appropriate. The housing crisis in this city is inappropriate for laughing at. It is something that I think we see every day on this street. It echoes sentiments from my colleague at the Green Party that goes to the roots of the social problem in this city. Things that the Liberal government have had decades at both levels to solve. Poverty, crime, injustice, housing. People need a friend, a roof, and a job. And this government has failed everyone at all three. Thank you. Nikki. Yeah, 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 it's a big one. Um, look, I, I, this is gonna be a reoccurring theme. Everybody who's come up here and asked a question, I've worked with. I was uh, on the board of directors at the 519 and volunteered there for 20 years. To say I'm familiar with the issues is something of an understatement. Um, the uh, housing is an issue. There are 60,000 ghost homes in Toronto, so there's plenty of, uh, there are some rooms that we should have. No people without homes, no homes without people. That's a core green idea, and one that the Liberal Party hasn't quite stolen yet. Um, but you're welcome to steal it, so long as you actually act on it. This is my issue. The other thing about, uh, thank you, uh, the other uh, thing about uh, housing is that we know that there is, that our market in Toronto is, is filled with uh, criminal speculation and the Liberal government has done nothing about that despite repeated requests and this could ease housing for just about everybody including, as you mentioned, uh, uh, refugees and new settlers. Um, and finally, again, just to go kick back here, we've seen a situation where the provincial government has completely undermined the municipal government in the largest city in Canada directly, cynically broken our municipal system which provides housing and the Green Party, thank you, the Green Party has a, pla a plan to connect the federal government and the municipal government and yes, the provincial government if they show up and actually work on some direct solutions. Not promise money, but actually deliver money and solutions directly to our marketplace, which we can do right now. We can stop criminal speculation in our marketplace right now. I think we should. Thank you. 
Thanks for the questions. Actually, there were several all embedded in that, uh, in that statement. I, I want to go back uh, to uh, the New Democrat uh, response. And I'm often accused of being a New Democrat hiding in the Liberal caucus because I'm on the left side of our party. But the reason I'm not is because of that answer that was given. And I need to tell you, when I hear someone misusing and misunderstanding facts about refugees so blatantly, there, that was last year's number I gave. It was an actual number, not a plan. And to say that because the 60% are, are privately sponsored and 40% are publicly sponsored through either blended programs or government programs, and to say that that is no federal money is a complete misunderstanding of the whole settlement services program. Every refugee that comes to Canada is entitled to language training, uh, employment and housing services through settlement agencies across this country. That's what we're investing in and we're doing it because we know that to give refugees and immigrants an, a best chance is not only good for them, it's good for us. Canada is better because of it. In the midst of that, we have asylum seekers that Mr. Ford has decided would not qualify for legal aid. The most vulnerable people in society, the conservative government in this province decided to cut out. We have stepped in and we are funding it as a federal government. We are doing it because we can't fill in every hole, every social service and education and post-secondary education and healthcare that conservative governments, whether it's Mr. Kenny, in Alberta and his GSA policy, whether it's Mr. Ford in Ontario and all of his policies, we can't fill every hole, but we will fill those holes like legal aid because the most vulnerable people will always get our attention. That's what we'll do. It's more that's, than just leadership. It is activity and action, and we're time. committed to doing it. Um, that is the end of our schedule of questions, and we are at time. So um, I want to give the folks on stage, um, maybe we can set one minute. We'll do like a bit of a lightning round. Um, and so we'll do one minute. And since we started this way, we'll go this way. So we'll start with you, Rob, and um, Ermias, if you could set the timer at one minute. Thanks. One minute. Oh, sorry, just clarify. This is the been, closing statements. This has been a really serious discussion and it's about important things. And I actually disagreed with Kim Campbell a uh, quarter of a century ago when she said that elections weren't the time to talk about serious issues. They are. And this community is engaging in serious conversations about our identity, our abilities to, to participate in society, and to do it. The reality is you're going to have a choice to make on October 21st. And as Elizabeth May said last night, I would echo to all parties, I don't think the Green Party will form the government. I don't think Jagmeet Singh will form the government. I doubt very much that uh, Mr. Scheer will form the government. I am fairly confident we'll form the government and we will continue to do the work that we've been doing on this, with this community, for this community, and through this community. We're going to be doing that in a way that respects our unique identities, our unique positions in society, and we will do it together and build a better Canada. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to speak to a point of order. I haven't had an opportunity to have the last word in any of these cycles because oh. I'm in the middle. So I'd like to speak at the end if that's possible. Okay, Thank that's you. fine. That's fine. So I wouldn't be here tonight without the support of my husband, Greg, who's watching at home on Facebook. So hello, Greg. Hello, honey. Um, our friends and our family and our neighbors, certainly. I mean, this isn't my first election. Uh, but it is one for the books. I was your candidate last year in the municipal election for this very same boundary, Ward 13, Toronto Center. Uh, one that you'll remember was um, almost as interesting as this one. We've had 26 years of Liberals in this riding, and I think after that amount of time, they're taking your support for granted. I would know I voted for uh, Bill Morneau, who's my competition here in Toronto Center, and the Prime Minister, because I believed what they were saying. To me, promises matter, and that's what I hear from people at the door day after day after day, it turns out they matter to you too. And lots of people, I'm encouraged to counter the, the kind of confidence that you've heard from Rob tonight. Lots of people tell me this will be the very first election that they vote conservative and they tell me I never in a million years thought that I'd be doing it. So I, I shake their hand and I welcome them uh, to the team. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you everyone for being here. Democracy is really important and when we all come to rooms together like this, we, we've really seen this right across, uh, across the country, that there are so many people who are coming together who are asking really hard questions. And pay attention to what people are committing to. Pay attention to what they are not committing to and pay attention to the things that they're committing to that are not in their platforms because that is really important. <laughs> What it comes down to in the end is choosing somebody that comes from our community who understands what we're fighting for. And it is the fact that people are leaving our community because they can't afford to live here. It's the fact that we have friends who are living with HIV who can't afford their medication. It is the fact that we are dealing with an environment that it is in crisis and that we do not have a liberal government that will take that seriously and we have a conservative government who does not care about the environment in any way, shape or form. So really we have a choice now to think about the future that we want, the future that we want to build for ourselves, for our kids, for our grandkids, and our families, to make sure that we have a clean environment, access to good healthcare, and access to good education, so that every, but everyday people can get ahead, and we can make sure that Toronto Centre stays a vibrant place for the LGBTQ 2 us plus community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, with the utmost respect uh, to all of the attendees here, um, these guys don't form the government, you do you have a chance to shape the government that's coming up right now. We don't know who the leader is, we know who it isn't gonna be, but what are we gonna to do to make sure that whoever is elected, whoever forms the government is kept honest, or at least as honest as you can keep a politician? How are we gonna make sure that they actually deliver on the promises, which sounded good but didn't come through? How are we gonna make sure that we have a federal standard for healthcare, pharmacare, all of these things which are built into the Green Party platform? Now, in some areas, you're going to have to vote, you know, hold your nose and vote for one of these guys. But in most of the writings across Canada, you can vote your conscience and vote for a party that will help keep these guys on track and continue to be on the right side of history. Force the kind of change we need as LGBT peoples, but frankly, as Canadians as a whole. That's the your Green time. Party is the only party that can do that That's for you. That's your time, Nikki. So vote for us. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to all of you for showing up and for listening. Thank you to all the community groups for your excellent questions. Um, and please, a round of applause to the four candidates and representatives of their party on the stage.